Okay, I think we should start. Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome Derek Attridge, finally, for a lecture postponed from last year in the History and Forms of the Lyrics series presented by the Humanities Divisional Committee on Poetics at the University of Chicago. We're glad to be joined today by many students from the Poetry in the Human College course sequence. I'd like to thank Stasha Gill for her work on the practical arrangements. Introducing Professor Attridge presents an unusual challenge. For this renowned scholar wears so many hats and has earned numerous garlands, crowns, bays, and laurels as well. Briefly, he has published influential books of literary theory with an emphasis on the singularity of the literary work signaled in such titles as The Singularity of Literature and The Work of Literature, as well as books on South African literature, particularly J.M. Kutsia, and books on Irish literature, especially James Joyce. But today we're narrowing our attention to recognize him as a major scholar of poetics, but more than that, one of those rare scholars who can justly be regarded as having radically reshaped a field of study, that of prosody, once a dry as dust byway. For centuries, English speaking and reading students struggled to accommodate lines of verse written in a stress-timed language to metrical patterns developed on the basis of Latin, a syllable-timed language, contorting themselves with inverted feet and irregular feet until their feet became all of a tangle. As Alexander Pope should have predicted, God said, let Attridge be and always light, or at least light-footed, as we now can dance or pick our way from boulder to boulder across the syllabic stream, guided by Attridge's instruction in recognizing and responding to rhythmic stresses. He would, as a scholar, remind us modestly that he is not the first to attempt metrical reform, but what he has devised fully responds to verse prosody in a language as intricately muscular as English, one of those rare moments when a reform looks so obvious that we might feel amazed we were so long hidebound, even if we still apply the old tools in historical analysis. But Professor Attridge's method doesn't just make life easier for those of us who aren't scansion nerds. It rightly shifts emphasis in reading poetry from the technical to the phenomenological, to what and how the poem is performing, that is to say, to the poetic event, and his many books on poetry are exemplary in their attention to the work of individual poems. Such focus on the singular event of a poem, which is where Professor Attridge's work in theory and in prosody converges, has now opened out into the surprisingly panoramic view of his most recent book, The Experience of Poetry. A history of poetry from Homeric Greece to the early Jacobean period in England, a span of two and a half millennia, as poetry became identifiably but equivocally distinct from song, dance and drama, if always still involved in varying measure with performative arts. This is not a straightforwardly progressive history, leading from the blind singer improviser to the aristocratic sonneteer, from the oral performance to the silent reader. The relationship between text and performance between a fixed formula and improvisation is shown to be dynamic from the start. And anyone who departs from a love story in reading to a child knows well that the oral doesn't always license the improvised. Throughout, the experience of poetry is engagingly exploratory, readable, staggeringly well-informed, while enjoyably anecdotal, negotiating the implicated history of poetry as event and text. The territory Professor Attridge maps is ambivalent, contrarious, sometimes crossing trackless steps, but all goes to produce an enriched sense of poetic language's unique power to at once represent, perform, direct, touch, and create. You really should read The Experience of Poetry, which is not only a book about pleasure, but is itself a pleasure to read, and I believe is due to be issued in paperback in September. Today's lecture promises to leap boldly from the Jacobean to the present. The question of what experience and whose experience, the question of what poetry, has been strongly raised by the catapult into celebrity 
of the inauguration poet Amanda Gorman, producing much excited commentary about the experience of poetry by a mass audience. I'm reminded of my late colleague Robert Byrd arguing wickedly at a conference of Russian poetic scholars that a poem recited by a factory worker in a Stalin era movie, a poem of the most slavering Stalin worship, was a great poem on account of the enthralled unity it produced in its mass audience. The old platonic question urges, how does poetry differ from rhetoric? Then what becomes of aesthetic experience in an age of attention overload? And how does aesthetic experience differ from sensation? As a guide to how a poem might be experienced, it would be hard to better Derek Attridge. And I invite you to join me in welcoming him through electronic mimesis from York to the University of Chicago. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm very, very sorry that I'm not there with you all. Uh, maybe we can uh, reinstate my cancelled visit at some time in the future. But thank you to all of you who have turned on your screens and are listening, I hope, in some comfort, um, more comfortable than a lecture theatre would have been. Uh, and thank you, John, for your generous words about the experience of poetry. I worked on that book on and off for about 20 years. And all this time I was calling it the performance of poetry. Because the question I'd asked myself and initially had uh, funding to pursue was, how was Western poetry or the forerunner of what we now call poetry actually performed during those two and a half millennia? But when I received readers reports and there were four readers reports, each one from a specialist in the four periods that the book covers, I noticed how often the word experience came up in their comments. And I realized that what I'd really been writing about was how poetry was received by its auditors and in due course, its readers. Given the paucity of direct evidence of these experiences, modes of performance remained a central issue and it didn't take very much rewriting to refocus the book as a book about experience. But what I didn't do, because it's not that kind of book, was to attempt any theoretical justification for my use of the word experience in relation to poetry. And I want to explore the concept a little today. So let's have my title. The only theoretical argument I did include in the book was a brief explanation of my understanding of a poem's mode of being, or that of any literary work, or for that matter, any work of art, as an event rather than as an object. The work realized as literature, rather than simply language, is not the set of words as they appear on the page or in the ear, but a particular kind of happening. We use the word event every day, of course, either to mean an occurrence or, as the OED has it, a significant or noteworthy occurrence. But it has a more specific sense in many varieties of continental philosophy, where it carries the implication of an unforeseeable occurrence, one that could not have been predicted by means of any calculation and whose effects, therefore, also come as a surprise. Among those who make use of some version of this concept, not all in the same way, of course, are Heidegger, Deleuze, Foucault, Lyotard, Badiou, and most importantly, from my own thinking, Derrida. Before I go any further, I should stress that in speaking of the literary work as an event, I'm not referring to literature in its widest contemporary sense, imaginative writing in general, say but that subset of imaginative works that does more than simply satisfy readers' experiences, sorry, readers' expectations. What I mean is that the, the vast array of things we call literature may well be experienced as events, but the particular kind of event that I'm interested in, the kind that those philosophers, philosophers are interested in, uh, pertains only to a small, um, segment of that vast array. I rather like Hans Robert Yaus's forthright description of works that would not qualify as, in his terms, artistic, drawing on his account of horizons of expectation within which all art 
is received. And if, there you go. To the degree that no turn toward the horizon of yet unknown experience is demanded of the receiving consciousness, the closer the work comes to the sphere, the sphere of culinary or entertainment art. This latter work can be characterized by an aesthetics of reception as not demanding any horizontal charm, cha change, but rather as precisely fulfilling the expectations prescribed by a ruling standard of taste in that it satisfies the desire for the reproduction of the familiarly beautiful, confirms familiar sentiments, sanctions willful, wishful no notions, makes unusual experience enjoyable as sensations, or even raises moral problems, but only to solve them in an edifying manner as pre-decided questions. It's rather a Germanic style, but the point is, I think, quite clear that for Jaus, and I think I would agree, uh, work that simply satisfies expectations can be distinguished from work that takes one into new mental, emotional territories. The term literature, as I'm using it, has an evaluative dimension, therefore, though what counts as literature at any given cultural moment is, of course, subject to historical change. The reading of a literary work, one that involves a deep engagement with the words, then, is a singular event. It takes the reader into unexpected realms of thought and feeling. It surprises by its newness, a response which need not exclude a feeling of recognition. And when I speak of reading, I'm including other ways of engaging with the text, such as listening to a performance or watching a play or a film. What was unforeseeable has come about, and the reader's word, world has changed, perhaps only slightly, perhaps significantly, in order for this to happen. The comment George Saunders makes about fiction at the end of his excellent recent book, which I recommend to you, A Swim in the Pond in the Rain, is more broadly true about good literature and indeed good art. We've been comparing the pre-reading state of our minds to the post-reading state, and that's what fiction does. It causes an incremental change in the state of a mind. That's it. But you know, it really does it. That change is finite, but real. And that's not nothing. Saunders also says we shouldn't overestimate or unduly glorify what fiction does, which I think is also true of the criticism of literature and art more generally. And the event of reception, like the event of production, is at the same time singular and reliant on what is general and repeatable, language, generic conventions, and so on. I'm going to turn off screen sharing for a while and just hold forth. Let me see if I can move away from John, who's filling my screen, which is wonderful, but I, I I'm sure John doesn't want to fill my screen. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how to do it. Oh, well, too bad, John. You'll just have to be my main auditor. However, it's clear that the writer and reader are both more than simply passive receivers, mere tabulae rasi, inviting inscription by the emerging work. As Henry Statton has argued in a recent compelling study, Techni Theory, Artistic creation, when it's a matter of the works of art we value most highly, is made possible by the know-how or techni inherited by the artist from a long series of precursors. The event of the emergence of the new can happen only if the artist actively and explores and manipulates those inherited materials. The reader, too, plays an active role when engaging with the work, combining an openness to surprise with a deployment of skills and knowledges absorbed from other readings, from the accumulated resources of criticism, from lessons and conversations, and from the culture more widely. For this reason, I prefer the hyphenated term act event for both the production and the reception of literature. The hyphen between act and event indicating the inseparability of activity and passivity, of the exercise of creativity and imagination in the application of relevant knowledge and expertise on the one hand, and on the other, the capacity to listen, 
to refrain from imposing pre-existing beliefs and assumptions and to set aside the instrumental mindset that governs so many of our engagements with texts. If the text becomes a work of literature only in the event of reading, as it had come into existence through the event of invention, it's obvious that the experience of the reader is crucial. It's the reader's experience of that event that brings the literary work into being. Experience figures importantly in a number of philosophical schools, notably empiricism, pragmatism, and phenomenology, which is often labeled the philosophy of experience, and a number of literary theorists and critics find the word essential. A list would include I.A. Richards, William Empson, and F.R. Leavis, as well as many of those associated with reader response criticism. It remains a somewhat problematic word, however, because of its mercurial variety of meaning. German usefully distinguishes between Erlebnis, subjective experience in the moment, and Erfahrung, accumulated experience, a more objective sense. French, on the other hand, adds an extra dimension by using the same word, expérience, to mean not only experience, but experiment. What I don't want to imply is that a theory of the literary work as experience is primarily an empirical, that's to say, psychological or neurological theory interested in what goes on in the reader's brain, or for, the, or for that matter, a physiological theory interested in what goes on in the rest of the body. Even though any conclusions that might be drawn about the reader's experience might be mappable onto these other domains. Nor is that it a primarily a phenomenological theory, although it does have much in common with the theoretical arguments of Roman Ingarden, Hans Georg Gadamer, and Wolfgang Ezer. Rather, I want to think in structural terms. What can we deduce from the accounts given by writers and readers, and from one person's introspection, mine, tested against the introspection of others, about the essential components of the singular event that brings the text into being as a literary work, understood from the reader's perspective? What are the necessary and sufficient conditions for the particular complex of responses that justify, justifies calling something literature? And how do different works and different kinds of work produce different experiences? The act event of reading, like the act event of inventing, um, in, involves the introduction into the sphere of the familiar and habitual an otherness that's often surprising, but because it makes good an absence in that sphere, has a feeling of rightness about it. When I mentioned recognition earlier, I think that's uh, the same thing I'm talking about here, the, the feeling that something that should have been available in the culture has now been, been available, been made available by the writer. Of course, the first time a highly original work is produced, that rightness may be obscured by the shock of its challenge to the accepted norms. I must stress that in using the term experience, I'm not relying on a notion of the reader as pure subjectivity, but as a singular node within the cultural network at a given moment, or what I've called an idioculture. A third term that's useful in pursuing these questions, one that like event and experience is both common, is common in both daily discourse and in philosophical writing is form. It's one of the slipperiest terms in literary criticism. It's slipperiness inherited in part from a similar shiftiness in the philosophical tradition from Plato and Aristotle to Adorno and Malabu. But one tendency in employing the term runs through its complex history, the tendency to think of it in static terms. In poetic analysis, this means treating the work as an object, describing the form of a poem as a certain number of lines occupying a divine, defined space on the page and exhibiting perhaps a metrical pattern and a rhyme scheme. Of course, there have been plenty of critical accounts of the unfolding of storylines, the development of character, the pulse of rhythm, the sequence of tension and resolution. But once the discussion turns explicitly to the question of form, spatial metaphors start to creep in. If the literary work is an experienced event, however, form can only be an aspect of what happens. It would be more accurate, therefore, to speak of forming or being formed or finding form. Form is not opposed to matter, 
In fact, in poetic works, the materiality of the language, its deployment of physical sounds, plays a crucial role. This operation of forming happens in many dimensions. The onward fluctuating momentum of rhythm and verse, the unfolding revelations of narrative, the dance of illusions, the shifting relationships to the referenced world, the echoings and remakings across the text of sounds, words, and themes. The experience of literature is, sorry, the experience of literary meaning is always simultaneously an experience of forming. Or putting it differently, to the extent that meaning is extracted from a text independently of the event of its forming, it's not being read as literature. And this indicates that meaning too should be understood as a verb. If a literary work happens as an event in the sense in which I'm using the term, a comprehensive critical account, whatever else it does, must include a description of the reader's experience of that event. In a historical study, there may be some attempt to reconstruct the experiences of readers of a previous period, though the critic's own experience is likely to form the basis of the argument, whether acknowledged or not. The critical account, if it's not a purely mechanical reaction, is an event itself, and it's one that can change the work for other readers. As Derrida says, even as it records, Inscription produces a new event, there, thereby affecting the presumed primary event it is supposed to retain in Graham Record Archive. End of quote. So there it is pointing out that uh, th there's no such thing as a purely um, uh, recorded recording uh, engramming uh, commentary. Uh, the work itself will change in relation to the way it's written about. In relating my experience of a work, attempting to, attempting to do justice to its inventiveness, alterity, and singularity as they have emerged in the act event of my reading, I can offer account, an account for other readers to test, accepting that my own singular constellation of cultural habits and norms, my own idioculture, will not be identical to anyone else's. Although critical readings of literary works usually adopt a rhetoric of objective description, the poem has this and does that, what's really being offered, of course, is an account of the writer's experience, except when the work is reduced to an object, that's to say, when it's shorn of its literariness. The distinctive quality of the event of a poem, I would argue, is that it takes place in real time. Formal features such as rhythmic patterning and syntactic arrangements propel the reader from beginning to end. I'd like to spend a little time with two examples exploring this. I chose the first because of its familiarity, its brevity, and its relative simplicity. Browning's Meeting at Night. I won't read the whole poem yet. I just want to show you briefly what it, look, what it looks like because part of the experience of a poem, if you're reading it on the page, is taking in how long it is. This one is clearly short, how it's structured. This one is two matching stanzas and the length of the lines. Here it's relative, relatively short, but we will not read it through yet. On the page or screen, when no one, with no one reading it, this is an inert set of signs. I prefer to use the term text for this manifestation of it. The spoken poem may also be received as a text if, for example, it's picked up by a recording device or heard by someone who doesn't know English. And even an English speaker might be able to read it simply as a set of sentences encoding meanings. Think of a proofreader going through it, for instance. In a very limited sense, these oral realizations of the poem are events, but not in the more specialized sense I'm drawing on. The text can also be read instrumentally in a number of ways, as an instance of the sexual mores of the mid-19th century, as an insight into Browning's mental world, as an example of the metropolitan English of its time, and so on. To engage with the text as a poem, and one that's not merely formulaic, but literary, is to be alert to the way in which form 
happens and meanings are staged in a temporal sequence, bringing to bear on words an appropriate set of technique skills honed through earlier engagements with poetry and wider cultural domains, including the forms and meanings of the English language, and at the same time being open to the unexpected and the other. The sense of the words as the poem unfolds is constantly being qualified or accentuated by the play of sound, the expectations and resolutions of syntax, and the energetic forward movement or momentary hesitations of rhythm. John Wilkinson suggests something similar in his study, The Lyric Touch. Oh, my turn to wave a book. I can't see myself on the screen now, so I hope you can see that. Uh, in his book, um, the, the Lyric Touch, uh, when, as I say, he invites us to follow a poem, the word following, I take it, is somewhat uh, related to my notion of experience. Let us for a moment imagine a first reading of Browning's poem without any prior knowledge of its content or context. To insist that meaning is a verb is to resist the leap to reference that governs non-literary discourse, or putting it differently, meanings are staged and the process of that staging is as important as the meanings themselves. Not many theoretical accounts of poetry provide a terminology to discuss this aspect. One that does, and one that I'd like to test here, is set out in Don Patterson's mammoth study, The Poem. Patterson is still in bad odor in many poetic quarters for his comments on what he termed postmodern poetry in an ill-judged introduction to a 2004 anthology of British poetry, but he sings a different tune in the poem. He now speaks of enjoying the poetry of his one-time bete noir, J.H. Prynne, and calls his earlier notorious introduction, quote, a graceless, badly timed, and poorly judged rant, which it was. Patterson's approach to meaning is in terms of what he calls conceptual domains or overlapping clusters of meanings that allow us to navigate a path through the thronging semantic universe. This, th thus the word cinema names a conceptual domain we're all familiar with, and we could easily enumerate a number of terms that belong to this domain. Screen, star, seat, popcorn, Hollywood, and so on. If I'm having a conversation in which this domain has been established, these words will take on specific meanings, different from those which would, have, would be assumed if we were using the same terms to talk about houses or astronomy or Los Angeles real estate. An attentive reading is one that establishes with precision the poem's conceptual domain. When one begins a new poem, an infinite set of semantic possibilities lie before one. Usually it takes only a few words to radically reduce those possibilities to a much smaller set by instituting a specific conceptual domain. The title of our poem, Meeting at Night, begins that process. Establishing a nocturnal setting with its associated implications, darkness, secrecy, silence, and some kind of encounter appropriate to that setting, undercover operations perhaps, in the pursuit of crime or espionage or romance. Clearly the conceptual domain is still open to further specification. The opening line of the poem immediately shrinks the broad conceptual domain established by the title, the gray sea and the long black land. While the coloring gray and black confirms the nocturnal setting and a corresponding ominousness of mood, the description implies a view from a vessel at sea, which would make the land a black strip against an expanse of less dark water. But the poetic work of the line is not simply the evoking of a real landscape. The way that landscape is evoked is what gives it its effectiveness. For instance, the line sets up generic expectations. The poem is, is to be descriptive or narrative, rather than say a philosophic me me meditation or a satiric epistle. Syntactically, two noun phrases set up an expectation for a verb to come, drawing the reader on. The line's rhythm also sets up expectations. It registers, to the reader familiar with English verse, as what would traditionally be called an iambic tetrameter, but one that exploits two of the common variations of iambic verse, an inversion, C and, 
switching the stressing of the third and fourth syllables, and three successive stresses in long black land that produce the demotion of the middle syllable, which just means we don't feel a beat on black, though we give it as much emphasis as its neighbors. But the strong rhythmic contour that emerges is also suggestive of a more popular meter, sometimes termed dolnik, a free four beat line with little tendency to fall into regular feet. The two monosyllabic noun phrases balance one another, each taking two of the line's four beats. But the second, though still emphatic, moves less slowly. The gray sea and the long black land, an acceleration that also propels the reader forward. You can compare this with the deceleration produced if we rewrite it, the long black land and the gray sea. That slows the line down and, and leaves the reader pausing in a moment of, of stasis almost, whereas the line as Browning wrote it uh, increases in momentum and leads the reader on. Four beat verse like this usually occurs in clearly marked larger units, most often in groups of four. So there's an expectation that similar lines will follow. And so they do the second line further particularizing the scene and the moon. Gray sea and the long black land and the yellow half moon large and low. The moon is not silvery, but yellow, not a full moon, but a half moon, not high in the sky, but low. So we register the poem's rejection of romantic tradition. It's making a claim of greater truth to reality. Syntactically, we're still waiting for a verb. The opening pair of unstressed syllables confirms that the meter has some dolnic features with another demotion on moon, keeping the movement unhurried, yellow, half moon, large and low. You'll notice I haven't commented on the rather obvious alliteration on the third and fourth beats of both lines, long, land, large, low. This is partly because it's obvious, but also because to me, it forms part of the sound texture contributing to the generalized sense of heightened language rather than to the specific uh, working of this or that detail. I don't want to say that the L's are mournful or, or disturbing or ominous because I don't think L's can ever do that. Patterson argues that the default configuration for lyrical poetry is pattern repetition of consonants and variety of vowel sounds. And that's certainly the case here. There are eight different vowel sounds for the 10 stressed words, while the, the consonants have that pattern. At the same time, there is an assonance between black and land, half and large, and an off rhyme between yellow and low. But this sort of commentary is easy to carry out and doesn't distinguish between successful and unsuccessful poetry. Lines three and four continue the catalogue of descriptions, but introduce metaphors for the first time and the startled little waves that leap in fiery ling ringlets from their sleep. Three of these metaphors involve personification, st straightforward personification, startled, leap, and sleep. What metaphor does in Patterson's terminology is to introduce into one conceptual domain a term that normally belongs in a different one. It is therefore in my terms, an event of invention, a bringing into being of the new, a little surprise. Here, words from the domain of human behavior are brought into the domain of the sea. The other metaphors are more surprising. The moon, it seems, has made the wavelets look like flame-colored curls of hair. And this involves a double process of metaphorization, as a term from the domain of, let's say, ignition is applied to the domain of human beauty, and then, trans and then both are transferred to the marine domain. We still haven't reached the main, a main verb and the syntax, syntax thus continues to pull us forward. The rhythm also becomes quicker and more agitated. The line is hurried along by an increase in the number of unstressed syllables, a run on and a promoted syllable. That's to say the word from carries a beat, but it's unstressed. Our familiarity with this form leads us to expect a rhyme with low at the end of the fourth line. And instead we encounter a rhyme of the previous line sleep matching leap. The, expect the expectation of a rhyme with low 
exerts more onward pressure. How are we going to get uh, the rhyme that we expected? And that rhyme does arrive at the end of the next line to be followed by a rhyme that links all the way back to the first line. As I gain the cove with pushing prow and quench its speed in the slushy sand. These lines continue the quicker movement of the previous two lines and come as a culmination of sorts, not that of the anticipated main verb, which never arrives, but of the action taking place in this environment. The sonic texture is again a pleasing combination of consonantal repetition, cove, quench, pushing, prow, speed, slushy, sand, and vocalic variation. Eight different vowels in the eight stressed syllables, at least in British received pronunciation. The conceptual domain is altered by the introduction of a first person arriving within the scene. The possibility that we were hearing a neutral observer has now vanished and the narrative now focuses on an individual engaged in a nocturnal mission. The pause created by the completion of the rhyme scheme, the period and the spacing and the numbering, which I'm not showing here, numbering on the page allows a jump in the narrative. Then a mile of warm sea scented beach, three fields to cross till a farm appears. Again, we wait in vain for a main verb. These are all clauses, subsidiary clauses. We can think of the experience of reading a poem as in part learning its particular version of English grammar, its ideogrammar, if you like. And this poem's grammar, it appears, has no place for main verbs. Semantically, we've entered a different world. The ominous seascape has given way to the pleasing sensations of the warm sea-scented beach, and the demotion of sea slows that line down, and the pictured action speeds up tremendously. A mile of beach and three fields traversed in two lines, and with this sense of haste, an increase in the feeling of anticipation. Metaphors are absent as the poem moves suddenly from wide angle to close up. A tap at the pane, the quick, sharp scratch and blue spurt of a lighted match. The poem also moves from rather general images, the scent of the beach, the sight of a farm, to very precise ones. A tap at the window, the sound and sight of a match being struck, speeded along by another run on. And although this is a, dis a simple dis description, uh, it, 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 there's much more going on there. There's an emphasis on secrecy, knocking at the window, not at the door, a lighted match, not a bright light. And it functions metonymically, using physical images to evoke the lover's passionate embrace. In Patterson's term, terms, met metonymy is intradomain, as, as opposed to the uh, extra domain linkages that uh, metaphor produces. Metonymy remains in, in a single domain. The sensory images are too restricted to co be complete in themselves. We, we realize that this is not just about a tap at the pane and the, uh, the spurt of a lighted match. Uh, and so they invite the reader to move within the conceptual domain. Let's call it the domain of assignation or tryst to the human actors involved. Rhythm is used to throw weight on the vivid image of the flame's blue spurt. It involves an inversion bringing two stressed monosyllables together in defiance of the alternating tendency of the meter. Once again, rhymes contribute to the climax of the final two lines and the repeated, as do the repeated vowel sounds in the last line, and a voice less loud through its joys and fears than the two hearts beating each to each. Secrecy is again emphasized, the voice necessarily subdued is louder than a heartbeat, and is implicit in the complication of joys by fears. And we read metonymically as well as the meaning expands from voice and heartbeat to two passionately embracing individuals. Each line has two metrical inversions, producing runs of three stressed syllables, voice less loud, two, heart, two hearts beat, that slow the rhythm and invite extra emphasis. Rereading the whole poem, adds a further dimension to it. Patterson argues that the richness of any poem, and I think he's right here, can only be appreciated on second and further readings, since during a first reading, its conceptual domain emerges only as the poem unfolds. In subsequent readings, 
this domain functions from the start to enhance the production of meaning and tends to turn a predominantly metonymic intradomain movement into a metaphoric or symbolic interdomain movement. That's to say the entire poem has a significance that goes beyond the immediate meanings that you get on the first reading. Once you see it as a whole, once you have a sense of what's to come when you start, you begin to reach out, as it were, from the domain of the poem into something larger. By the end of Browning's poem, the overall thematic domain has been established. Putting it crudely, it's about sexual desire and fulfillment by means of a secret assignation. Thus, on a second reading, the sense of increasing agitation in the first stanza becomes symbolic of increasing desire. In, and, and the metaphors that capture the wave's motion become themselves metaphoric of sexual arousal. The last two lines of this first stanza are almost too easy to translate into sexual terms. Maybe this is a failing in the poem. The most successful poetry, the, the primary operation of meaning remains undiminished by the expansion into symbolic realms. In the second stanza, the scene, including its meton metonymies, come to stand for a kind of passion. Perhaps even the claim that the most powerful sexual fulfillment comes about when there are obstacles to its achievement. Here, a sea voyage, the traversing of territory, darkness, and the need for secrecy. I haven't commented directly on one important aspect of experience, of experience of poetry, and that is affect, apart from stressing the function of surprise and the onward pressure of anticipation, if that can be called an affect. The represented emotions in Browning's poem are strong and unambiguous. The growing excitement that reaches a climax with the sounds and sights of the window and match, the explicitly named joys and fears, and the physical delight of the final line. But what of the affective dimension of the reader's experience? Here it becomes harder to avoid psychology and subjectivity, but what seems to be entirely my own emotional response is in fact a cultural product that can be shared with others. The reader fully engaged with the poem is invited, I think, to feel lesser versions, slightly different versions of the emotions depicted. Apprehension in the first two lines, an eddy of excitement in the next two, and a momentary release of tension in the last two. Then in the second stanza, expectancy, stronger excitement, and final satisfaction. As I hope I've shown, these feelings are not only responses to the unfolding meanings, but to the formal working of these lines as well. Now, one of the main pleasures of reading the poem, though it's hard to give a name to the affect involved, derives from its economy. Its extraordinary brevity is possible only because the story is wholly familiar we recognize what's happening from the smallest of clues. Each time I read the poem or rehearse it in memory, I experience with enjoyable surprise how few words it takes to convey a complete narrative. And this response is re related to an affect that we often overlook in our striving for critical objectivity and analytic precision, admiration for the achievement of the author, rising even to wonder or awe at the most stunning of inventions. Browning's brilliant economy is not just a fact about the poem, but the source of a particular kind of pleasure, one that makes the reader, or some readers at least, want to spend time with it, and perhaps even give lectures about it. I should say that, uh, if you don't know it, the companion poem called Parting at Morning is even more concentrated. This then is an account, necessarily inadequate, of my experience of the event of the poem, the product, of course, of numerous rereadings, but reflecting what happens each time I read it. It's always the same poem with the same sequence of surprises that against all logic remain surprises, and yet it's different each time because I am different and the context within which I'm reading it is different. I shouldn't say, and yet, it's the same poem because it's open to an infinite number of new contexts. What Derrida terms iterability is the process whereby the capacity for change is what makes it possible for identity to survive. Each time the poem forms and means freshly and yet with the reassurance of recognition. And each time I feel it has changed me slightly, not by modifying my sense of romantic love, which it isn't trying to do, but by enhancing, if only for a little while, 
my sensitivity to and appreciation of the power of concentrated, formally wrought language. I'll read the whole poem now before moving on to another example. Meeting at night. The grey sea and the long black land and the yellow half moon large and low and the startled little waves that leap in fiery ringlets from their sleep as I gain the cove with pushing prow and quench its speed in the slushy sand. Then a mile of warm sea-scented beach, three fields to cross till a farm appears, a tap at the pane, the quick sharp scratch and blue spurt of a lighted match, and a voice less loud through its joys and fears than the two hearts beating each to each. A traditional poem such as Meeting, Meeting at Night responds well to an account of the reading experience, but what about poetry that's not governed by the conventional rules of syntactic organization or semantic continuity? Let's call it late modernist poetry. I propose to examine a poem by Denise Riley titled Lone Star Clattering that appeared in the Poetry Review in May 2017. And imagine a reader coming across it in the magazine without having any specific knowledge about Riley or her work. Again, it's a short poem, this time organized in short lined couplets. This is what it looks like. In my commentary, I'll keep in mind John Wilkinson's wide, wise words concerning the relationship between artifice and imparted reality. John writes, the artifice cannot be so far the preoccupation of poetic practice that the poems repel all but a small audience of adepts, nor can the imparted reality be so far its object of attention that either there is insufficient artifice to detain the reader, for detaining can be a signal virtue in resistance to consuming, or to throw a new curve in emotional and intellectual cadence. I like to think that what I'm talking about is how poetry constantly throws new curves. To describe the experience of reading this poem is in part to attend to that balance or tension. On the one hand, the natural drive to pass through the signifiers to their signifieds, and on the other, the formal properties that impede this drive by offering other kinds of pleasure. There's a general problem about post hoc commentary with regard to all poetry, but particularly, I think, with regard to late modernist poems. The pressures of the institution, the institutions which license this activity, and perhaps our own self-esteem make it very difficult to be scrupulous in recording actual responses rather than inventing interpretive and analytical commentary after the fact. There's a premium on ingenuity, novelty, and keeping up with fashion that interferes with truthful documentation. I'll attempt to narrate my experience of this poem faithfully, which includes admitting to bafflement, wild goose chases, and blind alleys. Too many commentaries on late modernist poetry conceal all these moments and proceed as if the experience of reading was seamless and fruitful at every point. The title provides the reader with a possible conceptual domain. Lone Star evokes Texas and the mythology of the Wild West. Clattering, if it has its rarer meaning, would suggest rapid chatter and perhaps offer a label for the poem that follows, but if it has its more common meaning, it suggests a solid lone star, possibly a sheriff's star hitting a solid surface. Then, what got done to me stains through my hopes of passing as fully human. The poem opens with a statement implying that it's spoken by an individual, though perhaps not a fully human one, Late modernist poetry frequently abjures the register of the speaking voice, and there's no need to assume it if it's not, as here, signaled by the poem. The Wild West hypothesis put, is put in doubt now, though one can imagine a number of things done to the speaker in that context. But stains through remains puzzling, and the additional comment doesn't help very much. Though my bad blood won't gloss that. Bad blood would normally refer to a feud, Another, another possible allusion to the conventions of the Western, but might also connote a disease of the blood. Either way, we learn that it won't explain or brighten 
two meanings of gloss, the previous statement. But why is bad blood in quotes? There's now a pause at that semicolon. Up to this point, the syntax has ignored the disposition of language into lines and couplets, whose main function has been to signal this is poetry and to demand appropriate attention. The next two couplets consist of one clause. To canter around its crimson rosette would tart up a harm more my post-war bad luck than a told shame's mother. On reaching the period, we experience a sense of closure that's both syntactic and prosodic, each of the two halves of the sentence taking up two couplets. Although all the lines are very similar in length, in visual length, no regular meter has emerged. In fact, the choice of around in the fifth line rather than round counters what would otherwise be a regular duple three beat line. It would read to canter round its crimson rosette, but uh, around spoils that prison. Nor is there any particularly significant oral patterning. Another potential reference to the world of the cowboy occurs with canter. The mention of crimson makes it possible that the antecedent of its is blood, giving us a vivid metaphor. The conceptual domain of bodily violence yoked with the conceptual domain of military or sporting decoration in rosette. So its crimson rosette would then be the crimson rosette of the bad blood. But it could also refer back to the first statement or forward to harm. Next, we have to wonder how a harm, which is presumably what got done to me, can be tarted up, a phrase we could gloss as gloss. As we go on, we find out that this harm is more X than Y, where X is the mysterious post-war bad luck and Y the equally mysterious told shame's mother. The latter phrase is rhythmically salient in a way nothing has been so far. Three successive stresses, its syntactic condensation contributing to its harshness in the mouth. We've remained uncertain about our Wild West hypothesis, but now we get still the pose. Say yellow rose, go hard and plain to Amarillo. Here's our cowboy singing the yellow rose of Texas. And perhaps is this the way to Amarillo? as he makes his no-nonsense way to the Texan town, though it's only a pose. Googling reveals that Amarillo is known as the Yellow Rose of Texas, which I didn't know before. Appropriately for a song, the couplet is regularly metrical and has an internal rhyme, rose pose, and an echo, yellow Amarillo, as well as line final assonance, rose Amarillo. It may just be a pose, but it seems to have real consequences. They have shot me down, yet do I rise a tad orange. After the unvarnished announcement of the shooting, which sounds more like an aeroplane pilot than a horse rider, there's a curious inversion, yet do I, instead of yet I do. Any trace of magniloquence is immediately deflated by the colloquial closing phrase, this almost human creature is not red, but a tad orange. The final word clinches an alternative conceptual domain that has emerged during the reading. We could call it decorating. The decoration of the star in the title is picked up in the rosette, which is echoed in the rose. Stains, gloss, and tart up develop the motif, and the colors, crimson, yellow, and orange, add a particular palette, perhaps that of a sunrise. How the two thematic domains relate to one another remains less clear. If, as Patterson suggests, the rereading moves the poem towards symbolic processes, the fuller interpretation would need to take account of both. Let me read the whole poem, giving it another opportunity to do its work as a single movement in time. Lone star clattering. What got done to me stains through my hopes of passing as fully human, though my bad blood won't gloss that. To canter around its crimson rosette would tart up a harm more my post-war bad luck than a told shame's mother. Still the pose, say yellow rose go hard and plain to Amarillo. They have shot me down, 
yet do I rise a tad orange. The day after I finished a draft of this talk, I happened to be reading an article on medical whistleblowing. And in one of those co coincidences that feel something more than a coincidence, I found myself looking at the phrase bad blood in quotes. I learned that in what became known as the Tuskegee experiment, a large number of impoverished black Alabama sharecroppers suffering from syphilis were deceived into thinking that they had bad blood and that it was being treated. It wasn't. The medical authorities wanted to observe the late stages of syphilis in hundreds of men. Of course, I returned to the poem. The first four lines now read as an angry statement by one of those victims, perhaps after death. What got done to him in the experiment dashed his hopes of being recognized as fully human, and the diagnosis of bad blood did nothing to improve the situation. The following lines only partially respond to this new thematic context. The harm is obvious, and I discover through further research that a symptom of syphilis is a rash called syphilitic rosette. But post-war bad luck seems inappropriate, even though the duration of the experiment, astonishingly 1932 to 1972, makes a post-war scenario possible. Penicillin had become the standard treatment for syphilis in 1947. The told Shane's mother also preserves its impenetrability. As for the final four lines, well, Amarillo is a thousand miles west, west of Tuskegee, so it's hard to sustain any belief in a continuing speaker from that experiment. So how does the poem fare when subjected to the Wilkinson test? Does the artifice, largely a matter of unexpected verbal juxtapositions and line and couplet breaks intervening in the flow of the sentence, detain the reader to such an extent that it can appeal only to a small coterie? It was, after all, published in the Poetry Review, the Poetry Society's journal, and is the one poem by, by Riley featured on the Poetry Foundation website sponsored by Poetry Magazine, so its intended audience is extensive. My own experience was a mixed one. My detention at the level of language and form resulted more in frustration than enlightenment or pleasure, but the poem does draw me back to keep rereading. The added layer of meaning that emerged with the chance finding of bad blood is an indication of the poem's underdetermination. Readers will put widely differ differing constructions on it, dependent on contingent features in their mental worlds. Perhaps this is where a community of readers becomes essential. I'm hoping there'll be members of this audience who will help bring a little more of that imparted reality to light and thus help to make the experience offered by the poem a more balanced one. Or perhaps there's a single key that will unlock the whole poem, making it into uh, a single conceptual domain. There's an economic question too, also posed by Wilkinson as a test. Are there sufficient, quote, intellectual, emotional, and aesthetic rewards, unquote, to justify the effort required to negotiate its language. Riley's poem certainly makes strenuous demands compared to Browning's. Its rewards are less obvious. In discussing what he calls some heroically intractable poetry, Wilkinson proposes that though following a poem through, sorry, following a poem, not just any poem, a reader can become involved in the evocation and enactment enactment of a radical hybridity, pulling together ways of thinking about the world modernity has categorically but falsely separated. But such a reader, reading takes place in time, so continuously a reader unpicks and reintegrates elements of the poem in a felt motion which can restore a healed and full being in the world. Amen, I say. As yet my experience of the poem has been more one of hybridity than reintegration. Unlike a formulaic poem that has too few surprises, this one has too many. The rewards have not been commensurate with the effort and I don't feel reading it has changed me in any way. But I remain open to this possibility and comparing my experience with that of others is the best way to make progress towards realizing it. My emphasis on experience shouldn't be taken to imply a championing of subjectivity, autonomy or individualism. On the contrary, Poetry is a social art through and through. We may experience poems alone, but we do so as members of a community, both bringing what we have absorbed from others 
to our reading and enriching that experience by sharing it with others. Thank you very much for your attention. There you go, John. Thank you so much for, for that, Derek. And uh, um, I hope that somebody here will show us the way to Amarillo, which seems to echo in the background of this poem. Um, and uh, um, I invite people now to um, ask questions of Derek using the, the chat screen. So he will respond to your questions. Um, just before, to take my opportunity to ask a question before anybody else has time to put in a chat. I'm very struck by what feels like um, a, a temporal disproportion between um, the uh, activity of reading a poem in time and experiencing a poem in real time. And first of all, your proposition and Don Patterson's proposition that it needs to be returned to several times. And secondly, the amount of time which is required in order to provide an exposition of a poem. So I wonder if you'd just like to comment about that kind of accordion sense of time, which uh, feels like a feature of your talk. You're absolutely right. And I think the Browning poem is, is a good example of that. And um, I've just finished another essay in which I do something similar and spend many, many pages writing about uh, Ben Jonson's little elegy for for his son on, on my first son, which is even smaller. Um, and I, I um, commented there that, that after discoursing for, for, I don't know, six pages about it, I, mean, I say that, but it only takes a minute to read. So um, I think th that that temporal concentration uh, is, it's not necessarily true or a, an important feature of all poetry. Clearly there are, expansive poems which which take their time but I think the lyric tradition uh, is uh, is one that makes makes that a virtue that uh, in order to unpack what goes on in say a minute of reading time you need an hour of discursive time I think uh, it, it's it's a it's a a valuable and and significant aspect of of the lyric but I never quite thought of it in those terms. So thanks for, thanks for raising it. Shall I see what, uh, is, if anything has come in? Yes, sure. Uh, I can't see anything. Ah, here we go. Okay. Okay, good. I shall read this one from Lynn Atnip. I'm not completely satisfied by the idea that the change wrought by the Browning poem and poetry generally is a matter of enhancing my sensitivity to language, but I've been reading Wittgenstein and have in mind, quote, to imagine a language is to imagine a form of life, is my, is, quote, enhancing my sensitivity to language, quote, also, um, a matter perhaps of changing my sense of or possibility of a form of life. Hmm. Um, I certainly think that the kind of change that a poem or a work of literature can bring about uh, can involve what Wittgenstein is talking about there, that's to say a shift in my sense of what language does, what language can do, uh, the, the, the power of the various um, forms of language, uh, so that in some way my sense of the world has changed because of of the degree to which my sense of the world is dependent on my uh, internalized language, what I, the way I frame uh, 
my my sensations, my experiences in in linguistic terms. Um, when I was talking about the the um, effect of the Browning poem on the sensitivity to language, I I wasn't talking about that quite so much as just about a, a, a sheer the sheer extraordinariness that language in whatever that is, and this relates perhaps to John's question as well. Um, what is it, 40 words? The, 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 the amount of um, um, emotion, the amount of um, meaning, to put it rather crudely, that, that can emerge from those that small number of words uh, is not something we are normally aware of in language. Um, so I did mean it, it actually, for me, changes my sense of what language can do, which isn't quite the same as saying it changes my sense of the world by changing my sense of, of language. But that, that I do think is something that um, is always a possibility. Okay, thank you for that. Hello, Sarah, Sarah Newt. Hi, Derek, thanks for the talk. Your account of encountering a poem is quite temporarily linear, bringing the reader from the start to the end of a poem whether reading it the first time or rereading. I'm wondering whether the experience of already knowing poems can take them out of this linear framework. That is, what about the experience of having lines and phrases from poetry in one's mind as one experiences other things? Is that kind of experience at play in how you understand poetry? Thanks, Sarah. Yes, 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 of course it is. Um, the, the kind of linear straight through reading that I, that I represented there is, is a kind of, I mean, it happens, but it's only um, one way in which we live with poetry. And I, I think of, I think of um, poetry as something that we do live with, that, that it stays with us and not necessarily as whole poems, it stays with us as lines or fragments. Um, all I, I want to argue is that to do justice to the, to do fullest justice to the creativity and inventiveness and achievement of the author, and I, I've talked about the sense of responsibility one has to writers uh, in, in talking about this. Um, in order to do that, at some point, in some way, one needs to experience that linear totality, that um, if one only has the, the bits and pieces, uh, if one, you know, picks up quotes on Twitter and, and things, those, those are great. Uh, you're not doing full justice to the poem in which they appear and to the poet's work. But yes, of course, um, poetry works in many other ways than as the single, single linear experience of a poem. I'm scrolling down, but I don't see another question. Well, in that case, I'll, I'll ask another one and one. I'll ask whether or what difference you feel it makes to the conception of the singularity of the poem if my response to the Denise Riley poem is to situate it within a world of Denise Riley poems. In other uh, words, this is some somebody whose idiom I am deeply familiar with. Yeah, yeah, of course, I did say I'm going to pretend that uh, the reader I have in mind is um, completely unaware of Denise Riley and her work. Yes, John. Um, when we read a poem, we bring to it, and I did try to stress this at points, we bring to it a whole lot. We bring to it um, our knowledge, just not just of the language and of the genre, but uh, whatever we've picked up about the poet, about the context in which it appears, what kind of magazine it might appear in, uh, and all of that um, is relevant. We have to do a certain amount of mental sifting, I think, so as not to allow uh, irrelevant or, or um, you know, skewing elements to come into it, but um, a fuller 
Well, no, I wouldn't say a fuller. I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm very happy with that first time reader reading the Denise Riley poem and struggling with it. Um, but I think it would be, my stress on the, the, the notion of community is exactly so that someone like you can come along to someone like me who knows certain amount of Denise Riley's poetry, but not a huge amount, um, and, and, and tell me about other poems that will help me get more out of this one. So, so yeah, uh, we, we do and we should use whatever knowledge we have in, in the same with historical knowledge about, you know, someone, a Browning specialist will know much more than I do about um, Browning's situation at the time he wrote that poem, um, about how it relates to other poems of the time and so on and so forth. All of that can be relevant um, and can make the reading um, not necessarily better, but different and different in good ways. And it's good that there are these different readings um, side by side. Yeah, but thanks. And there, there is another question, at least one. Let me just get to the end of. Uh, oh, there's quite a few. Okay. From Joe Scapitone. Thanks so much for this accordion expansive talk. Ha. Huh. Can you say more about the pressure of the institutions that limit our capacity to account for the experience of a poem? And what about poetry that is made up of bits and does not attempt to progress linearly? Okay, two questions there. Um, the, by the institutions, I, I meant um, the, obviously the academy, uh, first and foremost, for people like us, the, 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 the pressure to produce original work, pressure to publish, to get published, to uh, innovate, to sound clever, to sound um, ingenious, all of that can, I think, interfere with uh, an honest account of one's responses to uh, literary work. And, and I'm certainly not excluding myself from this, the pressures I feel. Um, here's the page, I've got to write on it, I've got to say something that people will make, make people sit up and notice, and I start thinking about um, ingenious, inventive things to say, rather than how does this work strike me? If I reread it and reread it, what is happening to me? What is really going on here? Second question about poetry that's not linear. Of course, um, my, my to, to be more precise, um, my argument is that our experience of art happens linearly, happens temporarily. So uh, I would use exactly the same argument for uh, one's experience of a painting or of a statue. One starts somewhere, one moves around. It's an event. Uh, in the case of a static work like a painting, of course, it's much more different for different viewers because they'll, their temporal experience will be different. Um, so a, a poem that doesn't work in a linear way is still, is still experienced as an event but not an event in which the linear is a controlling dimension. And this makes for a greater freedom in the way in which the poem, or the order in which the bits of the poem are, are approached. And it obviously makes for interesting discussions among readers about how the poem seemed when it was read in this way, as opposed to when it was read in that way. Okay, and from Richard Stryer, why in capitals is seeing the poem as an object non-literary? Seems to me an essential part of its literary existence. The objective realm is crucial to your point about the way in which reading is not simply an individual experience. No. I would, what I'm saying, seeing the poem only as an object is non-literary. Uh, I showed the poems briefly as they appear on the page because that sense of the poem as an object, a certain number of lines, a certain length uh, is part of one's experience. So I absolutely agree that um, the, the, the poem as object is part of, of the experience. It's still part of a temporal experience. You're likely to have that uh, sense of the way it looks on the page first, 
and then to to go into go into it, enter it as a linear experience, as a temporal experience, uh, determined by the linearity of the poem. Um, so I don't see that as necessarily um, being any more crucial to the point about reading not being individual uh, in that we can discuss the importance of the look of the poem, say, uh, just as much as we can discuss the, the way the metaphors work or the way the rhythm works. So I think all of those are part of um, what make it not simply an objective, not simply an individual experience. But yes, I take your point about um, the, uh, the part played by the, ob the poem as object. Okay, I'm going on. Uh, from Joshua Skodel. You contrast the linear act event with the static conception of, of form, but also note that one has a richer sense of its temporal unfolding with the second reading after one has a sense of seeing it as a whole. This suggests that a static sense of the poem as object to be seen is part of the process, not its antithesis. Uh, yeah, I probably didn't use the, the word quite as precisely as I should have, seeing it as a whole um, would relate back to what I, I said in answer to the previous question. Yes, one might have a visual image of the, the poem on the page as part of one's experience, but um, when the, the point about the second and, and later readings is that when one comes back to it, one knows where it goes, one knows how it unfolds. It's not really seeing it as a whole. Um, what one keeps in one's mind, if one isn't actually rehearsing it in in one's memory, I suppose one is holding something, um, some neurological set of coordinates, but uh, in order to bring the poem back to oneself, one is, one has to rehearse it, one has to, the words have to move along in one's mind. And so coming back to it, yes, one has a sense of the poem, what the poem does as a whole. One therefore has a sense of what Patterson calls the conceptual domain in which one is moving. But in order to re-experience the poem, I think one, one does have to, to go through the, 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 the words. Um, Joe Scapatoni again, when I think of Amarillo, I think of the Cadillac Ranch as one of the touchstones of Route 66's extension from Chicago to Los Angeles. Don't know how much this has to do with Riley's poem, but thought I'd mention it. Okay, we'll think about that one. Uh, and I think that's the end of the questions that we have now, John. Okay, well, I, I think that does take us to roughly our target time for uh, concluding this event. Um, and this event I can um, also um, uh, advertise will be available as an object um, at a certain point, um, and we will let people know um, when they can review it again. Um, but for now, I'd just like to thank Derek Attridge for his very compelling talk. I hope that um, some people will um, follow up with ideas around the Denise Riley poem, and I shall post that to make it available for people so that they can uh, re review it at more leisure. But for now, uh, um, thank you, Derek, from an extremely cold and snowy York, um, and from us in an even colder, <laughs> snowy Chicago. Uh, thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, next quarter when you uh, come to uh, launch your book at the Seminary Co-op. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in. Bye there. Thank you.